Good morning. My name is Ariel Hall, and I'm the Digital Communications Specialist at Davidsonville United Methodist Church. We are so glad to have you with us. Let us know you're here by liking this video and leaving a comment down below. This week, we celebrate World Communion Sunday, and we continue on in our sermon series, Hope is Here. In this week's scripture, we learn about finding peace and joy through the humble life of Jesus Christ.
Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, that we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. The scripture today comes from Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me but the one who sent me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Are you responsible for the upkeep inside your house? I'm talking about the dusting and vacuuming, the mopping and the laundry. In our house, we like to blame the dog for all the dirt. And while there is a lot of dog hair that collects in the vacuum, there's also a lot of crumbs and dust and dirt that come from Frank and I. If we don't vacuum once a week, a film builds up on our hardwoods and dust bunnies begin hopping around underneath the furniture. If you're not responsible for the upkeep inside, what about the exterior, the lawns and the gardens? Forever weeds seem to be sprouting and spraying and grass needs to be cut or leaves need to be raked. Our homes and our gardens require regular maintenance and so do our souls. We need to spend time with God for rest and repair. We need time in the scriptures and with each other for learning and realignment. And when we spend time soaking in God's shalom, the dust and the dirt of our lives is washed away and the weeds are plucked out. God's kingdom plan is so very upside down, so very different from the world around us. Scholars say that our top American values are first, individualism. We are each special and unique, and we should be independent. We should look after ourselves by ourselves. Second, materialism. We have the right to be well off and physically comfortable because, number three, we believe in hard work. We work hard, we play hard, and hard workers rise to the top, and we were are rewarded for making work a priority with higher incomes and higher status and more toys. We value hard work and we also value action and achievement. We set goals, we work the plan, and we measure results. Give me a thumbs up if you agree that these are some of our values. I think this culture even seeps into the church. We just had our annual church conference last week, and between the discipleship ministries report, the church profile, the pastors and committee reports, we evaluated, submitted statistics and strategic plans for our people, our work, our buildings, and our finances. Goals and measures that we are submerged in encourage us to measure success like this graphic posted by one of our young adults. Now this is, isn't all that she had to say. We'll come back to the rest of her message later. But she began by saying we get so caught up in making a living that we forget to make a life. And she demonstrated with this graphic how Americans generally measure our success by job title and income. In this regard, the 21st century doesn't seem that different from the first century. We may be steeped in a work reward culture. Jesus and the disciples were steeped in an honor shame culture where one did all that they could to gain and retain honor and avoid shame. 
Honor came from hard work and achievement, but also from whom you knew and who owed you a favor. Let's just step into the disciples' experience for a moment. They had left their jobs and family to travel and train with Jesus. He had become popular, drawing crowds that followed him from city to city. He was widely known as a healer and as a teacher and as a prophet. He had garnered a lot of honor. And privately, the disciples had been to the mountaintop where they recognized him as Messiah, the anointed one, savior, son of God, the one that all of the Jewish people were desperately waiting for, the one that would restore the nation of Israel to its former glory. You can imagine how in an honor and shame society, they would be, want to be part of all of that, but they didn't really understand the kind of Messiah that Jesus would be, even though he had told them what was to come, his rejection, suffering, and death on a cross. They saw only his power and his popularity. Today's lingo, he had gone viral. And hanging around him brought them honor. I can imagine them in high spirits jockeying for position. Impetuous Pete declaring, I am his favorite. Beloved John retorting, okay, but I never did all the dumb stuff that you do. James, the brother of John thundering, I am the best candidate to lead after he is gone. Outreach specialist Philip professing, I'm smarter than all of you. And finally, former taxman Matthew ending the discussion with, but I am way richer than all of you fools. Jesus, with his upside down kingdom values, heard all of this and took it as a teachable moment, a moment to teach humility. Humility means having a modest view of your own importance. The root word of both humility and humble means low. We tend to associate this concept with feelings of insignificance, inferiority and subservience, of being meek and mild and unassuming. But that wasn't Jesus. Jesus didn't talk directly about humble. He modeled it with his behavior and he gave them an illustration. Whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all, he said. And then he lifted one of the children from nearby onto his lap and continued, whoever embraces one of these children as I do, embraces me and far more than me, God, who sent me. Now, children did not bestow honor on adults in the first century. They had no influence. They were and still are needy. They need to be fed. They need to be sheltered. They need to be cared for. When we care for those who are weak or in need, we are embracing or living God's kingdom values. Caring for the least of these will not bring you honor or wealth, but you will be participating in God's kingdom. Now Jesus tried to show them that greatness doesn't come from how many servants you have, but rather how many people you serve. Humility isn't about being insignificant, it's, it's about drawing your significance from areas other than wealth and status, work and reward. Rick Warren says it this way, true humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking about yourself less. It isn't about being weak because it takes a great deal of strength to let go of our pride and consider the needs of others so clearly. The Old Testament teaches us when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. That is from Proverbs 11, verse two. 
The young adult who posted about measuring success went on to offer this picture of her values. As a balance of life and work, wage and health, joy and free time, it's better. But someone quickly asked her, where is God in all of this? Now, where is God in all of this? The message that Jesus lived, the gospel that he revealed was straightforward. Love God and love each other. We could picture it like this, ourselves, children of God, working, earning a wage, taking care of our health, enjoying life because of our relationships with others, not drawing our worth from whom we know, but rather from how we love. Can we get out of our own way, escape our own self-first thinking, to truly be aware of those around us and what they need and the ability to respond to those needs? In the Gospel of Mark, the disciples seem, well, dim-witted. These men hung out with Jesus day and night. They were his posse, and yet they, even though he told them several times that the sacrifice of the cross was the way that he would become Messiah and Savior, they were so slow to understand. This isn't their only lesson on humility. It isn't the only time that Jesus will use a child as an illustration. They didn't get it, and so shortly thereafter, he had to repeat it. But their slowness gives me hope. Jesus recognized their humanity. He understands our brokenness. Jesus kept on teaching his disciples. He won't give up on us either. I've learned, I've learned that if I just had a little humility, humility I would be perfect. Ha, huh. well, not really. That joke originated with Ted Turner. I've learned, or more correctly, I'm learning, not to base my value on title and wages. Instead, I'm learning that fulfillment comes through relationships and sacrificial love. How many times have you met someone who appears to have everything and is yet still empty and sad? Harry Newen was a Catholic priest and an academician. His teaching position at Harvard was considered a great accomplishment. And yet, Harry Newen reached a time in his life when he was not satisfied. And so he left his comfortable position teaching at Harvard teaching some of the most brilliant students in the country and became a worker at Daybreak, a home for adults who were mentally disabled. After Nguyen had been at Daybreak for a time, he wrote, most of my past life has been built around the idea that my value depends on what I do. I fought my way to the lonely top of success and popularity and power. But now, as I sit beside the slow breathing Adam, a resident of daybreak, I see how violent that journey was. So filled with desire to be better than others, so marked by rivalry and competition, so pervaded with compulsion and obsessions, so spotted with moments of suspicion, jealousy, resentment, and revenge, he discovered that his humble life with the residents of daybreak was much more fulfilling. It is hard to have good priorities. It is difficult to live with virtue in the clutter of our society. Ultimately, the disciples were transformed by divine love and they became great and humble leaders. It gives me hope for all of us. We are all beloved children of God who, with God's grace, are always growing into our Lord's upside down kingdom values, like virtue and humility. Although 
like our homes and our gardens, we do require regular attention and maintenance. So I pray that all of us this week will spend time soaking in prayer and scripture and in the grace of God's shalom so that our dust and dirt is washed away and our weeds are plucked out and may we come to know the hope and blessing of living humbly with our Lord. Amen. If you know the words to this, feel free to sing along with me. Just as I am. But that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm well. Just as I am. Amen. Poor wretched blind. Just as I am. Poor wretched blind. Sight riches. Healing of the mind. I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcome with open arms, praise God, just as I am. Just as I am, I would be lost. Just as I am, I would be lost. But mercy and grace, my
Welcome to this time of communion. We're glad that you've joined us. We hope that you had a chance to come by our church office and pick up elements to use, but in case you didn't, take a moment now and find items around your home that you could use as we celebrate communion. And let us pray. Jesus prayed that we might be one, one in spirit, one in mission, in union and communion with each other and with you. Today, God, we confess our fumbling and our failures in accomplishing unity as we set aside yet another day to remind ourselves of the task. On this World Communion Day, Give us eyes to recognize your reflection in the eyes of Christians everywhere. And give us a mind to accept and celebrate our differences. And give us a heart big enough to love your children everywhere. We thank you for setting a table with space enough for us all. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of all nations, you created every person in your image and called us by your Holy Spirit to become one in Jesus Christ through baptism and through faith. In Jesus Christ, you showed us the way to live with our unique gifts and particularities, and yet in harmony with you and with each other. You, O oh God, are indeed above all, through all, and in all. So today we join with voices throughout the earth and in heaven saying, Holy, holy, holy. Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus lived among us to show us your love. Caring enough to feed hungry persons, stopping to touch people who needed healing, reaching out to those not like himself. And when people gathered to hear his teachings, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them to eat so that they might be fed. And when Jesus ate with his disciples for his final meal, they remembered his blessing of the multitude and listened as he told them, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. They watched as Jesus took the cup and blessed it and said, take and drink this. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and the whole world for the forgiveness of sin. After his death and resurrection, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the disciples told others through this meal that Jesus was the Messiah, sent by God for all of humankind. Remembering now, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the Savior of the world. Pour out your Holy Spirit on the table, spread this day around this globe and here, spread with breads from around the world. May all who partake wherever they live know the reconciling love of Jesus Christ. May your church go forth from communion with you to be one in Christ, one in witness to the world. In your holy name we pray, amen. Amen. Let us join together using the words that Jesus taught us, praying, Our oh, Father, who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may now eat and drink and remember in your home. Thank you for joining us for this week's service. Let us know you are here by liking this video and leaving a comment down below. As we celebrate World Communion Sunday, we ask for healing prayers for Liz in her eyesight, and we also welcome Rob into our church community and our family of the UMC. Join us again next week as we continue our sermon series, Hope is Here.